Well, welcome everybody. Really good to see you um, for this introduction to the thinking environment. Um, it's going to be a really interactive day, well, evening. So we've got three sort of practice sessions. And after some um, experiments with friends and colleagues, they're slightly different to what was advertised. But by the end of the evening, you'll have experience in part of the thinking environment and part, some ideas on how to create one that I really hope you'll then go away and, and try out. Um, and before I start talking about it, I think a question that is useful to you, for you to think about um, as we're going along. How much time have you had to think independently this week? Because in life, there's just so much to think about both in your home life and your work life. I mean, say when you're transforming a business, it may be that you're at the level where you're having to take a real step, step back and think, what is the purpose of our business? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What are the outcomes we want in the next three months, six months, long term? And how can we get the rest of the business to come along with us and maybe you recognize that there are some areas that you're probably not great at. Maybe it's that the leadership has too much command and control. Well, how do you give away some of that command and control without everything going to chaos? And are you going to encourage teams to improve their way of working, to use continuous improvement, to do experiments? And if so, what happens when those experiments fail? What are you going to do? Are you going to keep encouraging them, really trying to get them to improve? And you can't just focus on one team. You have to focus on the whole business because it's a system. And while you're doing all this change, you need to keep your customers happy and bring them along on the journey with you. And sometimes there's just so much to think about that you feel you don't have time to think. You make rapid decisions and think, we'll handle the fallout later. Change it. Rapid decision, rapid decision. But the quality of everything that we do depends on the quality of the thinking that we do first. And this is where the thinking environment comes in. So the thinking environment is a system for independent thinking. Now, a question for you before I go any further. If you think about various people, maybe some of you have got kids, you think about your kids, you think about your friends, you think about your colleagues and also yourself, do you think it's important that we think well for ourselves, that we think well independently? Yeah? Yeah. And can I ask, why do you think that? Why? What's the reason for thinking well independently? Can you identify any reasons why do you think it's good to have independent thinking? Say in a child. Because if you are happy, then others can be happy. Yeah, if you're happy, then they, yeah, they'll be happy. Charity starts at home. Yeah, yeah. Any other ideas of why it's good to have independent thinking? It gives variety of thought. Yeah, variety of thought. Absolutely. Yep. Anything else? Expanding your knowledge base because you're thinking about things. Yeah. Yep, expanding your knowledge base, absolutely. Yeah. If anyone has thought about something, I can actually commit myself to it, otherwise it's kind of just a very surface commitment. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is what, why Nancy Klein founded the thinking environment. <clears throat> so Nancy Klein is very big in education in the States. And she was interested, intrigued, to see what helped children to learn, to learn well and to think well for themselves. Because often in institutions, and that can be schools or businesses or other, or other institutions, the focus is really on conforming. It's for everyone to sort of toe the line, obey the rules, and not really raise difficult questions. 
So has anyone read the book Time to Think by Nancy Klein? Hey, a few of you. That's cool. It's worth a read. Um, so what she did was she went and she observed lots of different situations of people thinking for themselves. And what she found was quite shocking because what she found was that the quality of thinking, independent thinking, it wasn't dependent on IQ, on education, or even personality. But the single most important thing that helps us to think well for ourselves is how people treat us when we're thinking. And take this room. You're sitting here, you're quiet, you're looking in my direction. If you were sitting there playing games on your mobiles, chatting to each other, wandering out and looking, in the, looking out of the window, then I'd be in a totally different place. I wouldn't be able to concentrate on sharing all this with you. My thoughts would be pinging all over the place. And if you think back now to maybe some, some meetings that haven't gone so well, or maybe a conversation that didn't, and I wonder if you step back and reflect, was that because of the way you were treated, the way, the way the other person was sort of communicating with you, or maybe the way you were with them without realising. Because, say in a meeting, when you come up with a thought or an idea and you start to share it, if someone interrupts you, it's like a slap in the face. But if you manage to share your thought and get, get to the end without anyone interrupting, that's better. But if you know when you start to share your idea, if you know that nobody's going to interrupt you, that takes you to a totally different place. Because it means you can start to share and you can pause and no one's going to interrupt. And then you can carry on until you get to the end of your thinking. And that really sort of conforms to how the brain works in waves. You sort of focus and meander and focus and meander until you get to your end idea. So not interrupting and paying people attention is one of the most important things in creating a thinking environment. But Nancy actually identified 10 different components. which are here. Now, we're not going to go through all of these this evening, but I've put a link at the end of this that you can go to to find out more detail for, for all of them. So we've talked about attention and making sure you're giving attention. But obviously, if you're in, a, in an environment that's kind of tense and rushed, then you're not really going to be in the mindset to to concentrate and share your thoughts. It's like if you, if you go into a meeting and you've got half an hour and you've got 20 people in the room and you're told, right, we need a decision on this at the end of the meeting. So you've got half an hour, guys, off you go, have a decision. Well, some people might think, right, I've got to fight. I've got to get my point across, right? So I'm going to have to really focus and drill down and shout and whatever. And you may have some people that think, well, What's the point, you know? So having ease is also very important. And by ease, we just mean taking off that time pressure. Because by slowing down the process, we actually speed up thinking because people can focus. But so now, let's say we've got this situation where you're giving attention and you've got ease, so people are there, they don't feel rushed, they feel they can contribute. But we haven't got, I mean, time is money. You can't just sit in a room all day and sort of think and think and think. It's got to be effective thinking. And so we also need equality. And equality here has two different prongs to it. One is... Everybody in the room is a thinking peer. Everybody in the room 
their thoughts are valued as much as all the others. It doesn't matter if you've got the CEO and a, a junior software developer. Everybody's view is important. But the other one is to make sure that everybody has equal time to contribute. And this isn't easy to do because some people are more extrovert and confident and happy just to talk and share and talk and share, which is brilliant. And others are more introvert and may need to think quietly and then just not say quite so much. But by looking at having equality, it suddenly makes us realize if we're the people that are dominating the meeting. Because it can be at times that you feel that you're the only one saying anything. But that could be just that other people don't feel they have the chance to contribute. So by making sure that everybody has an equal opportunity, by the extroverts being more succinct, we can make our meetings much more effective. So I think it's um, time for the first exercise. Oh. You said about the extrovert being more succinct. I find that sometimes I need to talk through it, so me thinking about it in my head is not going to work unless I completely talk through it. So I can see how for an introvert, just thinking about it deeply would work, but for me, yeah. talking about it in five minutes is not going to help me because I can't switch to yeah. thinking about it in my head. So, so you're saying that being an extrovert, you need to have time to talk through it before you can contribute. And we're going to go through something this evening that will show you how you can do that, okay? But yeah, I get what you're saying, because everybody's different, everybody's different. Um, so for the first exercise, I'm gonna ask you to get into groups of five or six, whatever works for you. And um, we're going to do an opening round. Now this is something that we use at the beginning of the meetings. And we'll, I'll go into detail about why after you've tried it out, because I want to see what you think. And it's getting everyone in the room to take it in turns to answer a question. But that question is nothing to do with the meeting. It's nothing to do with the business. It's a positive question. So if you get into groups of five or six, and I'll show you shortly what the question is going to be, and one of you volunteers to start, and you say probably just three or four sentences, nothing major, to answer this question, and then pass on to the person on your right, although I'm not sure how it's going to quite work with the seating, but you pass on down, down the line or around the, around the circle until everybody's spoken. But remember, attention, so it's not to give any feedback, it's not to comment, just really look at the person who's speaking and listen to what they're saying. And don't worry about what you're going to say because when your turn comes, something will come up and you don't have to rush and instantly say anything. If you need a little while to think about it, that's absolutely fine. But the question is, what's going well for you in your work or your home life at the moment? And it doesn't have to be anything major. It could be something to do with your gardening or a recipe that you've done or managing to catch a train that you always miss. I mean, just, just something that's going well in your life at the moment. And then we'll regroup. And I'm interested to know what you think. Think about having, what you think about having this at the beginning of a meeting. OK, so I'll stop you in about three or three, three ish minutes. It shouldn't take too long. Off you go. So what did you notice? What did you notice about that opening round? 
Yeah. Yeah. The time was too short. I think that's probably a, a thing with practicing, and um, that's the, that, and that's the whole thing with equality and ease, and you know that kind of thing. Started to relax us. You started to relax. Yeah. Everybody was smiling. You made it uh, visual connection. Yeah. Other. Yeah. Connecting. Yeah. I think without the concept of speaking, you're actually taking a lot more information in. Mm. Yeah. Taking more information in. Yeah, that's good. Oh. Anything else? Yeah. I find it a little bit uncomfortable because I think I naturally kind of reciprocate when someone's telling me something, even it's like, oh yeah, that's nice, oh good, or, you know, it's, you just kind of have a bit of a yeah. play going, and so you said we all kind of felt like we shouldn't say anything. Yep. Even though you burst into yeah. the question. And that is one of the, the big things, is sitting there and not saying anything, even if you're, you're trying to be nice. But it does make a real difference when you don't. But yeah, to start with, it's really, it's very different. Yeah. So I just want to say that um, for the question and answers, the answers can use this mic because then the camera is attached. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. No, I, I'm glad that... Um, I'm glad that you found that because, you know, and that's what we find is quite often you, you get everybody in a room for a meeting and generally people are passionate and care about the subject that the meeting's about. But to have that positive question at the beginning really helps to sort of relax everybody and also to sort of get every, everyone thinking, well, the people here are friends, they're not foe. You know, every, I've spoken and people have listened to me. So it makes a real difference at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. yeah. So I get that, but since you were saying that sometimes you find time is too slow and this tends to get better as you're doing it, but how do you facilitate it when you're starting it out? Because if you tell people, oh, we're going to do this for three minutes, and you do it for three minutes, and you've not gone through everyone, do you extend it so everyone has a go? Or do you, I mean, if you tell everyone you can only speak for 20 seconds, that puts a lot of pressure on everyone mm. to just fill in the time slot. But if you let everyone speak however long they want, you can finish, you can do this for half a meeting. Yeah. And that's why getting the thinking environment working is not easy, because it means people really need to change their behavior. But something that we do is at the beginning of a meeting, remind everybody about those three qualities, well, all the qualities, but, but definitely the equality, the ease, and the attention, and timekeeping, you know, making sure people take the same length of time. But you can also, when you're getting used to it, you can have an agreement. You know, everybody should sort of self-govern how much they say, but it could be that when you start doing it, you do put a time limit on it, or if someone starts talking too much, just sort of like that just to get them used to the behavior. But getting the thinking environment to work isn't easy because it is a total change in behavior and it's not the way we're used to interacting. So to get it to work, you need to have resilience and you need to keep trying it and just so people start to experience what a difference it makes. But you will get pushback just because People aren't comfortable with change, and it's difficult to change. Second exercise already. Um, so what we're going to do now is called a thinking pair. And this is the purest independent thinking of the thinking environment. And this might, for some of you, be a weirdness level of 10 out of 10. Right? So I'm going to ask you to get into pairs, and because it's quite a small space, you'll need to have your um, indoor voice on when you're doing this. But I'm going to ask you to get onto pair, into pairs, and we're going to do this exercise for eight minutes. So it's four minutes each, four minutes each, and I'm going to time this one. Um, and for the for the for four minutes. One of you will be a thinker and one of you will be the partner. And then after four minutes, you'll swap over. Now, as the partner, your job is to generate thinking in the thinker. 
You're not there to give advice, give your opinion, summarise what they've been saying. You're there to stimulate their thoughts, to really ignite their thinking. So, when you sit... It's done again. No. When you, when you sit down together, you get comfortable, and the partner looks at the thinker, and they ask this question. What would you like to think about, and what are your thoughts? It could be anything. It could be work. Again, it could be gardening. It could be cooking. You know, whatever springs into your mind. I do ask that whatever stayed in the, said in the pair stays in the pair. So as long as you're all all right with that. And then, as a thinker, just say what comes into your mind. And you can pause. You don't have to fill all the, the gaps. And it might be, this is the first time you've, a lot of, well, most of you, I presume, will have done this. And you might run out of things to say fairly quickly. Or you, four minutes might go like that. It's totally, totally um, just depends on your way of thinking. But if you run out of things to say, you ask your, your partner for another question, because then they know you're not just pausing for thought. You need to be asked something else to stimulate your thought process. And that's, what more do you think, feel, or want to say? And then hopefully the thought process will all open up again and the thinking will start flowing. So I'll tell you when four minutes is up, I'll raise my hand and then just finish your sentence and swap over. And then we'll reconvene and um, let me know what you think. Any questions before we start? So you're thinking in your head, you're not saying what you're thinking. No, you can do either. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're the thinker, yes. Speak, speak as much as you like. Or it could be that you want to think in silence, and that's absolutely open to you, but your thinking partner will still be looking at you and really wanting you to think well. So they may be nodding and smiling. Something not to do is frown, because that's, that's like an interruption. Um, but yeah, if you split into pairs, and I'll let you know when the, when the four minutes is up, okay? If, you, if you'd like to change now. If you're ready to regroup. That's cool. So, with that pure independent thinking, what did you notice? I'll be mic for everyone. Yeah. What did you notice about doing that? That I had verbal diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same. It didn't feel like four minutes. Mm. When you said it, it seemed like a lot. Mm. When you start talking, you just keep going. Mm. Well, I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was nice because the problem that I'd had that I was mulling over that's the first time I actually stopped and thought about that one problem for a period of time without slotting into other things that were going on in my head so it actually already triggered something else for me to have a think about just in that four minute period mm. so that was quite um, that was quite good good a very good listener <laughs> <laughs> so um I felt really safe in that sense, uh, given that, you know, just uh, two of us and, well, I mean, you know, that goes to like how, how the other, well, the thinker in mm -hmm. that sense, um, or the listener in this case, uh, really, you know, participates, you know, and has that eye contact and makes you feel 
that you are being listened to. So that happened in, in my case. So yeah, I, I relate to the verbal diarrhea perhaps, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. I would just wait. No, it's, it's for the, uh, okay. I think I felt short of words, so after speaking like uh, for a minute or two, and I thought that I just conveyed the message, and there's nothing mm -hmm. else. So I had to change the topic of yeah. what I was talking about, and then I started on the next topic. And then uh, somewhere between the listener was very um, uh, was uh, very focused in listening, uh, but I was thinking that uh, because we are doing this exercise, so I'm telling him, but uh, he will not respond basically in between. So when having a conversation, it's difficult to speak for four minutes continuously, and no one uh, basically uh, asking some question or giving you some suggestion if you are telling some problems. So it was difficult, basically, uh, thinking and talking for the four minutes uh, in a continuous fashion. And that is quite common, that there's a real... Some people, like you say, the four minutes has gone like that. And for, for others like yourself, it just seems a very long time without anyone coming in and talking to you. But if you keep practicing it, it's a totally different way of, of thinking. So if you just keep trying it and suddenly... Well, not suddenly, maybe gradually, but you'll, you'll suddenly have a topic and you'll just be able to talk about it. But yeah, initially, it's just such a change in behaviour. It's not what we're used to at all, so it can feel really quite foreign. I was seeing why, why are you not raising your hand a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> the time seemed to go on for a long time, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's what I've had when running training courses. Some people say it's way too short, and other people say, well... You know, what do I say? So it's a real, it's a real difference just in, in how people are. I also found as the listener, on the listener part, it was quite hard not to try and then ask or make comments to try and you know, lead the conversation, mm. whereas, you know, you're supposed to be almost passively listening or active passive listening, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're listening, but you're listening with the intent of, of helping them to think because you're interested not just in what they've said and what they're saying now, but what they're going to say next. And, you know, by doing that and just focusing on that, it can really help ignite people's thinking. Yeah. I, I sort of similarly thought when I was listening and not being able to speak that I found myself very tempted to try and sort of use my facial expression to sort of indicate what I thought about what he was saying or mm. sort of... Uh, say, oh no, you know, that where I would have said, oh, that sounds bad or something, mm. um, being suddenly really aware of my facial expressions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, probably this part of the thinking environment is the bit that I found hardest to start with because rather than me helping people and coming up with solutions, quite often we'll do this thinking pair for me to encourage them to think of the solutions. So my value is not in making decisions. My value is helping them think of, you know, what decisions to make. But that's a real culture shock. And it can be a bit, you think, well, what am I being paid for? All I'm doing is listening and, and that kind of thing. But the difference it makes is huge. But for me, that was the most difficult part of the mindset shift, as well as not interrupting. And I am a reformed interrupter, although my husband, Giles, in, in the front is raising his eyebrows, but really, I am a reformed interrupter. Yeah. Mike. Hi. I, I do some coaching as well, and, and it's interesting to see that that, that that statement is one of the main statements that comes up all the time as you're a starter when you're, trying to, when you're coaching people. Mm. Um, and it's the kind of the leading question that, that you ask when, you're, when you have a team or you're trying to, uh, and, I, and I will use that with different teams when I answer my opening line every time. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually the basis for thinking environment coaching. So you can go for an hour and a half and just be asked those two questions. And to start with, when I, I first started having coaching, 
I thought, well, what a con. We're paying all this money, and they're not telling me what to do. You know, I've got this new role. I'm going for coaching, and they're not going to help me out and tell me what to do. And I walked in there thinking, mm, give it a go. And I came out exhausted because all these problems that I was having, and I knew there was no solution to them, I solved simply by being asked those two questions. So that is the basis for thinking environment coaching. It can also be that maybe you, there's one particular problem you want to focus on. And then, as a coach, I will question, what are you assuming is stopping you from doing whatever you want to do? Because in life, we make so many assumptions. Like, I'll, I'll sit on a chair, I assume, I assume it's going to hold me. But we don't realise that some of those assumptions are really limiting. And it's not until you start to question them that you realise there's actually no truth in them. So that's sort of the basis of the thinking environment coaching. But another way, another time that this thinking pair can be useful is um, where you were saying that you need to really talk and think things through before coming across. Say you're having a retrospective and you've been through the what went well and you're going to focus on the what you, could you improve. And quite often you've come, you know, you've managed to get the sprint, all the sprint stuff done, you, you've done your demo, you rush in and you've got to come up with all these ideas. So what we'll do is at that stage, We'll split into pairs and do this thinking pair, but modify the first question in terms of what you think we could improve, what are your thoughts? Because by that, in parallel, you've got all these pairs thinking, and then you can get together in a group and then go round and see what everyone's come up with. But that just means you've got time to think about it before you then have to share with everybody. Okay? So, final exercise. Um, and this is a dialogue. So you'll, again, split into pairs. We'll do it for, again, eight minutes. But this time it's exchange thinking. So I'm going to give you a topic and I'll ask one of you to start as, as the partner and one of you to start as a thinker. So the partner will ask this question that I'm going to give you and the other person will respond. But they'll have to think about equality because it's a dialogue. So they then hand back to you and say, what do you think? So when, you, when you're thinking and talking, when you're ready for the other person to contribute, just say, what do you think? Because again, that stops interruptions happening from people not knowing if you're pausing for thought or you finished thinking. And this is similar to a thinking pair, but you have to have a lot more discipline because it can be that as they're talking, you come up with a question and the temptation can be to, you know, my turn but don't interrupt. And really, you should really try and focus on what they're saying rather than thinking about what your response is going to be. It's not just waiting politely for your turn. It's giving them attention and encouraging them to think. And when they ask you, you'll think of something. You'll think of something. So the question. If you knew that you could get better thinking and more effective teams with the thinking environment, what would you do? Now, I've already said it really isn't an easy thing to do. So I don't want to belittle, yeah, you just try these things and everyone's going to agree and do it. But with persistence and resilience, it does happen. And the difference is huge. It's so rewarding. Because all these people that have been employed for their knowledge, their ability, and, and just their, their sheer prowess, 
suddenly you unleash all this potential in them because you're actually listening to them and they're able to contribute. So again, if you split into pairs and have the dialogue, have you got any questions about how to do it before we start? No? And I will time you for eight minutes and I'll still put my hand up and then we'll regroup. Okay? Off you go. Okay, if you'd like to regroup now. And so, what did you observe for that one? What did you notice? Um, it became a bit like a ping pong match. We started out with lots to say, and it got shorter and shorter. And as soon as one person dried up, it was like, over to you now. Uh, what do you think? Um, so yeah, it, it, was, it was difficult. It just dried up after guessing what, four or five minutes? Yeah, OK. And that's probably because the thinking environment is a new thing that you've only just learned about a few minutes ago. Um, but can you see how normally, with a, something that you were both really sort of into and passionate about, how sort of useful that would be? Yeah. Yeah. I found it quite difficult not to like think about what I would say, because in the other exercise there is no pressure on you to say anything. But in this one, you kind of know at some point mm -hmm. it's going to be passed back to you, and you're trying to actively listen and not think about your own thoughts. Yeah, and, and it and it it is difficult to do that, and that's why the. The thinking pair is a sort of pure form, you know, where you really are just interested in what they're saying rather than worrying about what you're going to say. And yeah, however hard you try, you're not going to be able to stop yourself thinking about what you're going to say, but it's trying to kind of minimise it. But yeah, that's a difference. Yeah. So because I wasn't having my natural urge of always jumping in and basically being super American, I found myself, <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I found myself trying to make really expressive facial like things to be like, I am listening, I agree with that, that is really tough, and then kind of deviating from the original purpose of where actually you're not supposed to talk and mm. listen. Yeah, and there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with sort of encouraging people and the odd nod and a, a smile and that kind of thing. Um, but something that I found difficult is not to frown, you know, just as a reaction, not because you want to change their thoughts, but as soon as you frown, someone's thought process will, will change. But yeah, yeah. Anyone observing the conversation I had would have noticed that we kept uh, sort of challenging each other and then agreeing with each other. So actually, uh, it, it seemed very persuasive um, mm. manner conversation as well, getting people to see, you know, because they have to fully concentrate on on you putting your case forward or you have to do the same for them. Um, mm. It seemed a very persuasive way of talking. Yeah. And I think what, what other, other people have comment to me, commented to me about is because they know they're going to get a turn, they don't feel that kind of urge to say something straight away. So it re relaxes their thought process by doing that. Anything with this. No. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd concur. Actually, I, I had the opposite feeling to what other people said. Actually, the what do you think, I think gave you freedom to really, uh, really listen. When it came back to me, what do I think, you then really, I was then really able to mull over what, uh, what you'd said. So I think it gave a certain freedom. And I, I didn't find myself pre-thinking what I was going to say, mm. just knowing it's going to come over at some time, what do you think? And then when we're asking what do you think, it wasn't straight into it. I think both mm. of us were pausing, with, well, what do we really think? Yeah. yeah, and you can pause because you know you're not going to get interrupted. Yeah. 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 Good. 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 Yeah, so I think that there is, 
so with the whole exchange thinking and taking it in turns and that kind of thing, we also do that in, in rounds, you know, like you did the opening round where you all took it in turns. But we can do that for in meetings as well. To stop with an open discussion, you know, you tend to get the more extrovert people dominating um, and just people sort of competing and interrupting again. But, I mean, with one of the first meeting I did with uh, Thinking Environment, and it was to an audience of um, technical people who had a technical problem to solve, and when I, they didn't realise the thinking environment was coming to them. Um, and when I explained about, you know, ease and equality and attention, and I said, we're going to have an opening round and then more rounds and no open discussion, and you could see the eyes roll. People go, oh, what is this? Um, but they were a really good bunch and they gave it a go. And what I loved, first of all, they found, they found a couple of solutions to prototype, but also the comments that I got afterwards, because people said how they couldn't believe what the more introverted people came up with, because normally they just don't get the opportunity to contribute. But the comment that I really, really liked most was, well, one guy who came up to me and he said, you know what, I didn't realise I had those ideas in me until everyone was looking at me and I came up with them. So he hadn't realised quite the depth of his, his knowledge and his thoughts until everyone gave him that opportunity to think. And there, there are some sort of subtle things you can do also to create that thinking environment, which is things like when people come to you with a problem and people come and say, oh, look, I've got this real problem. I've done this, I've done this. And, you know, I just don't know what to do next and I'm in a hurry and whatever. You know, what shall I do? And if you say to them, well, what do you think? And it is amazing how people, because they've already thought of, the, they've thought of the question and they're already starting to think of the answer. So they'll stand and they'll, they'll you know, talk to you and reason it through. And then they'll say, thank you so much for solving my problem. <laughs> and I was there listening and encouraging them to think, but I didn't give them any information, guidance, anything. And it was purely them thinking, and they came up with their own solution. So has anyone got any general questions about the thinking environment now? Hello. <laughs> um, what experiences have you had in terms of this working well or working not so well in a face-to-face -face environment versus a virtual environment where maybe you're on the telephone and sometimes we do have bad habits of interrupting because you can't read body language between that I'm still thinking and that's why I've stopped talking versus mm. you've stopped talking therefore I assume that's the invitation for anyone else to then join or add mm. or comment or whatever. Mm. And in fact that's something I've been doing very recently. Um, because our, our team's globally distributed, you know, some in Australia, some in South Africa, some over here. And um, it was one of the, after I'd been there about a month, they said, right, you run this meeting. <coughs> and so what we did was we, we sort of came up with topics and then we, we would take it in turns. We'd have a round going around the room and we'd think about equality. Um, and so someone would say something and then pass on, what do you think? And so we'd have a diagram of where everyone was, so everyone knew where everyone's sitting. Um, but they can't believe the difference in the meetings. They feel a lot more structured, and they're getting a lot more sort of deep thought into them. But yes, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's as easy, you know, when you're, you're doing a your Zoom meeting or whatever. But you can, especially when people see the benefit of it, and it does work. But it's that thing of handing over by saying, what do you think? It really does it well. Yeah. Um, so my question is, is this thinking environment technique um, some sort of therapy but in the work environment? Because it seems to me that it's almost like just listening, letting them come up with the answer by themselves. Or am I just getting... Get 
completely wrong here. No, I mean, I think it, it is good that people can, you know, think for themselves and come up with their own ideas, but it's also really good for the business. So strategically, you know, you want everybody to be able to think for themselves, you know, have your autonomous teams where they can think and decide things. Um, you know, so, I mean, I always feel better having had a coaching session, but the result of that is that I've come up with ideas and solutions or things, other things to think about or that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Or not? Yes, in a yeah. way. Yeah. Ask a lady question again. No. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what are the, uh, are there any resources apart from the book that uh, you have mentioned? This is number one. And the part of the other question is what are the uh, various other uh, basically benefits that we can get apart from uh, a meeting? So, so, I understood that in a meeting, if we do um, environmental thinking, that it might be that everyone gets a chance to share their ideas and it might benefit the organization mm -hmm. or the team itself, okay? But apart from that, uh, what is the benefit for uh, understanding th this to one oneself without, mm -hmm. can it be practiced alone? Mm -hmm. That's what my question is, that can you self-improve by this? And what are the other benefits apart from the meetings? Mm -hmm. So I suppose in terms of what I've been doing, um, I've used it with my, my nephews, you know, so when they come to me with, with something, you know, what do I do, what do I do, well, what do you think, you know, and getting them to think about it. So I, I mean, I think as a single, you know, if you try and, try and sort of do it with no one else there, I'm not, I'm not sure how you would do it, but it's something you, you can use all the time in, in, in life, you know, you just, just encouraging other people to think whether it's a conversation or, or whatever, and suddenly being aware of quite how much you interrupt and stopping interrupting, you know, you can, you can really make a difference even outside of business and outside of meetings. Yeah, so I tried once this with my wife and after asking two times, she best me. I'm asking you, don't dare you ask me anything. <laughs> well, funny you should say that because with my husband Giles, he told me to stop doing my Jedi mind tricks on him. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to pick who you do it with. You know, if you're too close, you know, then, then it can be. But, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? One Um, I, was, I was just interested in the backstory. How did you come to actually get, become interested in this and start using it? Well, I was at a, a startup company that was growing rapidly, and um, I got promoted. And the head of um, HR said to me, you, you, "You know, why don't you have some coaching?" So I said to her, "Yeah, okay, I'm up for coaching." But she picked thinking environment coaching. And so I went and had these coaching sessions, saw how useful they were, got more interested, and then went for a, a training course with Time to Think, the company that, that Nancy started. Um, and from then on, I was hooked because I suddenly saw how in lots of different situations, not just coaching, it made a huge difference. So I can absolutely recommend the, the Time to Think courses as well. Yeah. Um, I think we're running out of time slightly now. So what I'd like to do now is a closing round. Um, but you can stay sitting where you are. We'll have to do probably a closing zigzag because of the way that the seating is. But if you just say, and someone can volunteer and then we'll figure out where to go from there. Um, just two words about how you feel about the thinking environment. Just two words, how you feel about the thinking environment after this. Um, anyone can volunteer to start and we'll kind of do a zigzag. From there. Genuinely interested. Cool. We go. Thank you. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Rather interested. Um, don't want to bring a pun in, but uh, thought provoking. <laughs> Uh, good practice. Mm -hmm.
Everyday uses. <laughs> Are you interested? Curious, interested. Uh, agile mindset. Mm -hmm. At the back. Um, thank you very much. And I'm just having one, one slight promo slide. So, the Agile Tour in London, October the 18th, and Giles will be presenting Donata Travel's Way of Working and Agile Transformation. So he'll be presenting that there, and I'll be going to watch. So if you're there, come and uh, seek us out and we'll have conversations. But thank you very much. It's, it's, you've been a lovely audience, and it's lovely to have so many questions. So thanks a lot. Thank you.